Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Advancing Adventism. Now, have you ever wondered what gives you the ability to think? What makes you a thinking conscious being? Most people think that it's due to some non-physical part to our person, like a spiritual essence that inhabits our bodies. And this is usually referred to as soul or spirit. And it's this non-physical part to our person that's thought to be responsible for our ability to think. But as you're about to see, this is very, very different from what early SDAs taught. Early SDAs rejected the notion that there's a spiritual essence inhabiting our bodies. In their view, what gives you the ability to think is the organization of your brain. Or as SDAs put it, matter can be organized to think. So what we're going to be doing is looking at some pages from this book by J.N. Loughborough. He's an early SDA pioneer that traveled and worked a lot with James and Ellen White. And in his book, An Examination of the Scripture Testimony Concerning Man's Present Condition and His Future Reward or Punishment, he addresses the topic of what gives you the ability to think. So we're going to be looking at some of this, and uh, I'll just give you a brief recap of the part leading up. We're going to pick up on a pages like 40 to 41. So um, just to give you a bit of the context, he starts off by kind of outlining some good principles of investigation. He's kind of modeling for his readers what would be um, a good approach to take in reading what he's going to be writing on because it is a controversial subject and he knows that there's, you know, a lot of different views on the topics he's going to be covering. And he's just like really talking about how in so doing, what we really need to do is we need to not worry about what we've been taught growing up or what others may think. We really need to ask, what is the truth? So then he goes on and he really starts to get into the nature of man and man being created in the image of God. And he says, okay, so before we move on with this topic of the nature of man, we really need to ask if we're created in the image of God, well, is God a person? And that might seem like a weird question to ask, but what early SDAs meant by saying God is a person is radically different from what other Christians meant by saying God is a person. And I don't just mean it was slightly nuanced. I mean, it was radically different. And we have a whole playlist covering that. So I'll just refer you to that. But in this section under is God a person? is where we're going to be picking up because he gets back into the nature of man and he addresses uh, the question of whether we have a soul in our bodies. So that basically brings us up to pages 40 and 41 where we're going to be picking up. So we're going to make that just a little bit larger so we can see that better. And we're going to pick up at the top in the examination. He says, in the examination we have made of the creation of man, his fall, etc., we see no record of immortality or of any spirit being given to him that can possess consciousness separate from the body. We think that the testimony from Solomon, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, may now be understood. Then he quotes that, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was and the spirit to God who gave it. And that, that's the end of the quote. He says, we find no record that God gave any spirit to man except the breath of life, which in Genesis chapter 7, verse 22 in the margin is called the breath of the spirit of life. The same original term that is rendered spirit in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, ruach, breath, spirit, etc., is used in Genesis 2, verse 7. Now, basically, all he's saying there is, hey, this Hebrew word, ruach, that word is what we find in Ecclesiastes and in Genesis. So it's the same word. It means basically the same thing. So then picking back up in that blue, he says, then Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 states merely the disorganization of man. Dust returns to dust and the breath to God who gave it. Says Job, chapter 12, verse 10, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Okay, then he's going to um, mention an objection that people have raised, okay? Says the objector, your testimony from scripture seems to show that Adam was not created immortal, yet I believe we are immortal. We inquire, 
So then this is Loughborough addressing the objection. He says, we inquire, from what source do we derive our immortality? It must be either inherent, derived from Adam, or else it comes to us directly from God. So there's only two places we could have gotten this immortality. Either we inherited it from our ancestor or uh, God gave it directly to us without passing it on through the line of Adam. Okay, so those are the two options. Then he says, we reply, we did not get it from Adam for he did not have it himself. If he had immortality and imparted it to us, his posterity, then the soul cannot be immaterial as claimed by the advocates of natural immortality. Now, just to be clear, he's just saying like, this is part of the argument posed by the proponents of the natural immortality of man or the natural immortality of the soul that in, is thought to inhabit our body, right? Um, the reason it's said to be immortal is because it's immaterial and immateriality, you know, isn't corruptible. Or, you know, that's the idea, right? So he's like, hey, if Adam did have immortality and passed it on to us, well, then the soul can't be immaterial as claimed by the advocates of natural immortality. So here's the explanation for that. Immaterial is the opposite of material. And that's just literally breaking down the word. The prefix I am just is a negation. It negates whatever follows after that. If you put the prefix M on the word possible, well, something's possible, then it's able to be done. But if it's impossible, it's not able to be done. It's not possible right? Or impatient, um, not patient. So it just negates the part that follows. So immaterial is the opposite of material. He says material is something, matter, has length, breadth, and thickness. So it has extension, has, has this body to it, is shape, the size. And one of its properties is said by philosophers to be divisibility. So it has parts. It could be divided and rearranged, okay? Immaterial is the opposite, not material, not matter. Then it does not possess those properties. So then he says matter is capable of subdivisions for divisibility is one of its properties. So that's matter. Matter has properties of divisibility. It has parts. But immateriality being the opposite is subject to no such divisions. So then listen to what Loughborough explains in the green there at the lower part. Then if the soul of Adam was immaterial, it was not susceptible of subdivisions so as to give immortality to his posterity. Okay, so again, what Loughborough is saying is the proponents of the immortality of the soul or even the idea that we have a soul that inhabits our bodies and that's responsible for our thinking process and our, our thoughts and consciousness and all of that. The idea of that being the case involves immateriality. But immateriality can't be divided. It can't be passed on by genetic inheritance because that would mean it is divisible. Okay, then if it didn't come from Adam, but if we are supposed to have an immaterial soul, where'd it come from? And that's what he's going to address next. So he says, then if man has an immortal soul or spirit, it must come direct from the hand of the creator at the birth of each individual. Because again, remember, he said, if, if we have an immortal soul or spirit, where'd we get it? Well, it had to either come from Adam or from God. So he, he first addresses whether it was possible that we inherited this from Adam. And it's immaterial, so you can't pass that on through genetic inheritance. So we can scratch that off of our two options. And well, then let's consider the next one. It means we would have had to have gotten it directly from God at the birth of each individual. Because again, remember, we couldn't have inherited it. So if we didn't inherit it, we only got it when we were born directly from the hand of God. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. Now he's going to consider the possibility of that. 
He says this position would be monstrous, for they tell us the soul is the life of the person, and unless this soul was imparted, there would be no life. Thus we see that God is charged with giving souls to every being that lives, no matter how miserable their birth. And again, they tell us the soul is the mind. Then some of these souls must be very limited in intellect when formed, as appears by the idiotic portion of the community. Now, before I move on, I just want to make sure like, that we understand Loughborough didn't mean anything insulting by the word idiotic there. You know, language changes over time, and this has been something like 175 years earlier. This was printed in 1855, and when this was printed, the word idiotic didn't carry the same type of negative or insulting connotation that it carries today. But anyway, his point here is that it would be monstrous to say that God was responsible for that person's condition, that God gave that type of existence to that person. So that's the point Loughborough is making. Then he goes on, he says, one great reason urged that man is in possession of some principle of a higher nature than matter is that man thinks, and with all candor we are told that matter cannot think, has not the power of self-motion, and would eternally remain inactive were it not for the immortal power of volition which man possesses. So the power of volition, the power of the will, you know, um, choice, all that. So then he says, we inquire, do beasts possess an immortal will? They certainly have the power to will and move their bodies about. So he's like, this is one of the reasons why we're told that mankind must have some principle higher than matter because we think and we have power of, of choice or will and, and we can move our bodies about. Because one of the arguments being used at this time anyway was that matter just can't move itself. So there has to be some immaterial spiritual essence or power that acts upon the matter and causes the matter to move. Now, that's not really a popular um, theory today, but this is what he's addressing, just so, you know, it makes sense what he's saying here. So then he's pointing out how animals, they, they're moving, you know, they have the ability to move themselves about and they can choose things and all that. And yet people wouldn't say that they have an immortal soul or spirit. He says, philosophers have only given us the properties of unorganized matter, but everyone must admit that by combination of matter, results are produced and properties made manifest, which did not exist in the original matter unorganized. Okay, so then let's move that up so we can see that a little bit fuller and let's continue reading. He says, organized in a certain form, Matter is made to produce music, and yet music is not a property of matter, but is the result of a peculiar organization of matter. Now, he's going to explain this whole organization of matter and how music is produced, but first he's going to give more of an objection that someone might have to what he just said. But, says one, the music is not in the material instrument, but in the mind. Okay, okay, so let's track with that. Now, notice what he says next. But the mind does not produce the sound. Sound is produced as the result of the organization of the materials of the instrument, the air being the medium through which it is conveyed to the nice organism of the ear, and there the mind takes cognizance of those sounds. Okay, so everything there that he's describing, you know, we can see that's all a material process. You've got this organization of the instrument. So if, if we're talking about a piano, and I don't know, they're probably not still using ivory for keys on a piano, but whatever they're using for the keys on a piano nowadays, you could take that and you combine that with different types of wood and wires and felt for the hammer that strikes the wires and all these things. And then um, when you hit that ivory key or whatever key, you hit the piano key and 
it causes the hammer to strike that string and that vibrates and then you have the molecules in the air being moved by that action and then there's this sound wave that's formed and as it travels through the air and, and of course the air is material it's various elements including oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen and i forget what all is in our air but anyway this is all matter and um as it goes through the air then that conveys it if, if you're in the line of the sound wave then it strikes the bones in your ear and those bones vibrate causing more um, movement of some of the organization of your body and then the brain takes awareness of all of that happening and you then perceive that sound okay so he's describing this and he's showing how this is a material process then he relates an objection that someone may have he says but says the objector man reasons is capable of choosing and refusing okay so then he replies to that objection and he says the same may be said of beasts they choose but say you this manifestation of knowledge in them is instinct is instinct a property of matter then Loughborough says, instinct, as it is termed, if traced through the family of the brute creation, would be found to exist in a variety of forms, and so nearly allied in some to the operations of the human mind, that some men would doubtless call it reason. So he's saying, like, in animals, there's a lot of different types of instinctual behavior. Some animals have an instinct to do this, some animals have an instinct to do that, and in some animals, their instincts look a whole lot like the way humans behave, okay? And he says, you know, so much so that a lot of men would doubtless call it reason in these other animals, okay? But even so, few would be willing to say that these brute beasts possess immortal souls, right? So then his point is, then instinct, as it is termed, is the result of organization, and yet in some animals is pronounced reason. So he's saying, like, look at these animals and their instincts. That's the result of the peculiar organization of their bodies, right? And even in some of those animals, you would pronounce it as reason. Then we inquire if beasts are in possession of intellect without immortal souls, why may not man with an organization more refined and a greater number of reasoning faculties be in possession of reason and intellect of a higher tone and yet not be immortal? So Loughborough is just reasoning with these people. He's like, look, if you're willing to say that these other animals are behaving with instinct and and even to the point where a lot of people would say yeah they are reasoning and if you've ever been around animals much and you've watched their behavior you can see that animals have the ability to reason in fact when they're determining whether or not they're going to obey you like like if it's a domesticated animal if you have a dog or a cat or a horse or whatever and you're wanting them to do a certain thing sometimes they don't always want to do it right you can tell they really don't want to do it sometimes they'll do it anyway but sometimes they choose not to right and it might even be that your very same animal um your very same pet in one instance chooses to do one thing and then in a very similar situation but just whatever different enough your animal is going to choose to do something different okay so we can see that animals have the ability to choose and he's just telling these people like if you can admit that in these other animals their thinking ability comes from their material organization then there's no reason to say that in humans our thinking ability comes from some immortal life principle or some immaterial soul or spiritual essence so then notice what he says next and this is in the yellow highlighted portion he says we do not wish to be charged with the position that we claim mind is material for we do not we believe however that thought is an effect produced 
by material organization. Okay, now let's consider that highlighted portion for a moment. When he says, we do not wish to be charged with a position that we claim mind is material, for we do not, he isn't saying that they believe or claim that mind is immaterial. That would be completely contrary to everything he's already been saying throughout the book thus far, okay? And more that he says later throughout the book as well. When he says, we do not claim that the mind is material, all he means is that they're not saying that the mind is an object. It's not that you can pick up something that is called mind, like you can pick up your phone or pick up your glasses or whatever. That's what he means by saying, we don't claim that mind is material. But then notice what he says they do believe. We believe, however, that thought is an effect produced by material organization. Now, an analogy that can help make this very, very simple and plain, straightforward um, in meaning is if we consider the process of digestion. So think of digestion as synonymous with the production of thought, okay? So digestion isn't a material object. It's not a material thing, but it requires material organization to be in action, okay? So when we eat our food and it goes into our GI tract and it's broken down in the stomach and it's, you know, disorganized into smaller bits, smaller parts. It's so it goes through this division of its parts and then it's redistributed as these essential nutrients that our bodies need. That's all a material process. And we understand that it's a process, uh, just like migration of birds is a process, but you can't pick up something called migration. Likewise, you can't pick up something called digestion, and you can't pick up something called mind. That's what he means by saying we're not claiming that mind is material. What we believe is that thought is an effect produced by material organization. So as you can see, what Loughborough is explaining here is that what gives you the ability to think isn't some immaterial, immortal, soul or spirit. Thought is an effect of the material organization of your brain. Okay, now in another video on our channel, we address some of the things that Ellen White had to say about the early pioneers' understanding of the pillar doctrines of our faith. So if you're wondering, well, how much weight should you put into what Loughborough had to say about our ability to think and what is responsible for our ability to think. I recommend that you check out this video. It brings several of her statements together that shows why she endorsed the writings of the pioneers and, of course, that she endorsed the writings of the pioneers. Now, one brief statement from that video is found in one of her manuscripts where she's talking to a congregation that knew J.N. Loughborough, and she tells them that he was with them from almost the first of their work, and he knows and he understands these things and others understand them. Now, the these things, you'll see it in the context if you, if you watch the video or if you go to the manuscript and just read it there on one of the Ellen White websites, you can see that she's talking about the SDA pillar doctrines and that Loughborough understands these things and others understand them. Now, in addition to that, there's another video that um, I recommend checking out in connection with this topic. Uh, it's also on our channel, The Early SDA View of the Nature of Man. And in there, we have um, statements from various pioneers, including a couple from J.N. Loughborough. Now, just one short statement from his that um, shows the position of the early SDAs regarding whether or not humans are unitary beings, strictly material in our person, or whether we're dualistic beings, part material, part immaterial, or part physical, part non-physical. And they very clearly rejected the duality of man. They didn't um, believe in dualism 
of anything, including the nature of man. Um, but they point to the fact that the Bible treats man as a unit and as a literal being. And then finally, one more resource that I would like to recommend in connection with the topic at hand about what gives you the ability to think is also on our channel, What is Materialism? The Forgotten Foundation of Adventism. Now, this isn't the type of materialism that we would commonly think of today where it's, you know, greediness for monetary gain or wealth or anything like that. This is a word that refers to the belief that immateriality does not exist at all. And we'll have more content on our channel over time. This is uh, a very important topic to be covering. And here's just one short statement from some of what Melissa covers in this video, What is Materialism? This is a statement from B.F. Robbins in an 1860 issue of the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. He says, honestly, do I believe that the doctrine of immateriality as taught by them, and from the context of the fuller quote, if you go to read it or if you watch the video, you'll see who he's referring to when he says them. So uh, the doctrine of immateriality, which has become so popular in the professed Christian world, to be subversive of the whole Christian faith as taught in the word of God. Now, what does that word subversive mean? Well, if something is subversive, it means it's undermining. It undermines the whole Christian faith as taught in the word of God. Now, unless we understand that early SDAs entirely rejected the idea that immateriality can even exist, it's impossible to rightly understand our SDA pillar doctrines. And not just our SDA pillar doctrines, but as the early pioneers would say, it would be impossible to understand the truths taught in God's word. As they pointed out many times in their writings, the scriptures are entirely materialistic. They do not promote the doctrine of immateriality anywhere. Understanding this is essential if we want to be able to understand what early SDAs taught regarding how it is that humans are able to think, what gives us the ability to think. And as we've seen from Jay and Loughborough, early SDAs taught that matter can be organized to think. With all that said, I want to thank you for joining us. We hope you were blessed. Uh, as I said, we have more links in the description, including a link where you can download a free PDF copy of Luck Burl's book. Um, and if you found value in the content, please share the video with someone that you love. Many blessings.